In the 1830s, some people believed that women should be quiet and obey their husbands. But not Fanny Kimball. She was an independent spirit who spoke her mind, especially when it came to slavery, something that she hated. When Fanny Kimball married a rich Georgia plantation owner, it was only a matter of time before her views on slavery and his would conflict. Frances Ann Kimball was born in England to a family of actors. In 1832, she sailed for America and soon became the toast of audiences in Boston and Philadelphia. She was 23 years old and considered to be one of the best Shakespearean actresses of her time. But no one was more infatuated with her than one Pierce Butler of Philadelphia. He was rich, the absentee owner of one of Georgia's largest Sea Island rice and cotton plantations. The butlers, like their neighbors uh, on the island, on, on St. Simon's Island, uh, came, their families came from South Carolina after the Revolutionary War looking for better land to grow both rice and cotton. And there was a cycle that was set up. Um, they came with money. They had money to invest in both slaves and land. They uh, planted their cotton and their rice. Uh, they made money. They bought more slaves. They bought more land. And in that way became very wealthy. And uh, they were unusual in terms of the sort of average slave owner in the South, uh, whether it be Georgia or anywhere else in the South, in as much as they had hundreds of slaves versus 10 or sometimes as few as five. After a stormy courtship, Fanny Kimball and Pierce Butler married. In the winter of 1838, Fanny's husband agreed to take her to visit the family plantation on Georgia's coast. During her four months there, Fanny wrote letters to her friend Elizabeth Sedgwick. My dear Elizabeth, these discussions are terrible. They throw me into perfect agonies of distress for the slaves, whose position is utterly hopeless. For myself, whose intervention in their behalf sometimes seems worse than useless, for Mr. Butler, whose share in this horrible system fills me by turns with indignation and pity. But after all, what can he do? How can he help it all? Moreover, born in America, how should he care or wish to help it? And of course, he does not, and it fills me with despair that he does not. And voila, it is a happy and hopeful plight for us both. But Fanny Kimball was unhappy, troubled that her life of extravagance and ease was paid for with the sweat, blood, and tears of slaves. Pierce Butler considered slaves to be property, a cost-effective tool no different than a plow or a shovel. But Fanny Kimball thought a person's liberty was most important that using slavery to create wealth was simple greed. Fanny Kimball's view of slavery, um, you have to understand she comes from Great Britain. And uh, she comes from an, uh, a family who's been involved in the arts. And she also comes from a country that had abolished slavery early in the century. And so she's already predisposed before she comes to this country to be against slavery. Fanny Kimball couldn't get over the deplorable condition in which the slaves were forced to live. Their plight both repulsed her and tugged at her heart all at the same time. The slaves' harsh living conditions shocked Fanny. She was most concerned about how the women were treated. Beatings or flogging on the butler plantation were common, so Fanny intervened by going to her husband. Yesterday evening, I had a visit which made me very sorrowful. If anything connected with these poor people could be considered more sorrowful than their whole condition. But Mr. Butler's declaration that he will receive no more statements of grievances or petitions for redress through me makes me desirous now of shunning the vain attempts of these unfortunates as I used to be of listening to them and receiving them. The imploring cry, oh, missus, which greets me whichever way I turn, makes me long to stop my ears. 
For what can I do or say any more for them? This was a harsh life. The butler slaves were given minimal food, shelter, and clothing to survive. A few favored slaves, though, would be given extra food or a hand-me-down dress. The poor little favors, the rice, sugar, the flannel that they begged for with such eagerness and received with such exuberant joy. It is true, I can supply. But to the entreaty, oh, missus, you speak to Massa for us. He sure do as you say. I cannot now answer as formerly. And I turn away, choking, and with eyes full of tears for the poor creatures, not even daring to promise any more the faithful transmission of their prayers. Years later, Fanny Kimball and Pierce Butler divorced. He lost his plantation gambling. She settled down near Boston and continued writing and acting. Fanny Kimball turned her diary into a book published in 1863, the middle of the Civil War. Her anti-slavery sentiments stirred up strong feelings against the South in both the North and in Britain. There are a thousand reasons why the South lost the Civil War. One of them may have been Fanny Kimball and her private diary about life on a Southern plantation. After the war, Fanny Kimball's daughter Frances ran the plantation, paying former slaves to work. She believed that ending slavery was a mistake. About Georgia's economic history, there are more stories to tell, so we'll be back. This is Georgia Stories 2. I'm Colin Seedor. 